Hello and welcome back, uh, everyone. So, I think uh, about a week back, or maybe about a couple of weeks back, we did this primer on Tesla, and we spoke about um, you know the company at a very high level, right? So, like at uh, almost like an overview of uh, of the company, and uh, I would think it was a lot of fun, you know, researching and talking, and you know, I, I guess. Uh, both uh, Shashank and I are very passionate about it. So, Shashank, your thoughts? Um... I absolutely love talking about Tesla. It was something we have been talking about for so many days, years, and just making it happen and how much of fun we had. It was amazing. And on that topic, I think we'll turn the tables to you and ask you, as a Tesla owner in this episode, mm. what do you really like about Tesla as a car? Talk to oh. you about value proposition. Oh, man. Okay. So I, I would think it's a lot of things, uh, uh, Shashank. I think um, to start off, let's talk about uh, maybe let's say, so so, hmm. so what I'll do is I'll try to maybe talk about the purchasing experience and maybe compare it with uh, traditional automakers, right? So if you think of the purchasing experience for me is so smooth where I have to go into a website and irrespective of whether you visit that website or I visit that website, it is one price. There is no there is no haggling on price. There is no, uh, uh, you know, if I, if I call up the dealer, I may get a better price and, you know, I can try to negotiate on some kind of hidden fees and stuff like that. So there's a lot of trust that's, um, that's built between the company and me where I know that the price that I pay is the price that everyone in my location would pay because maybe different locations based on stocking fees and stuff like that might, there might be different fees, but I know that it's a fair price that everyone would uh, pay and would all get the same number. So I think there's, there's that sense of uh, trust that's built, which uh, if, if any of, uh, you know, any of you watching have, um, uh, have bought a car, you'll probably realize that that's not the case with buying traditional cars. You have to call the dealer and then you go negotiate with them and, you know, you tell them, okay, I'll pay you 11,000 and the dealer says, no, 13,000. And then you realize somebody else bought it for 10,000. And it's, it's a big, um, you know, it's a very, there's a lack of trust between, between the buyer and, uh, and the seller. Whereas in, in Tesla, I can trust that the price that I pay is the price that everyone else um, pays, right? So I think that's that's uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to the purchasing thing. Now, then let's talk about let's say maintenance, right? So I think the the thing with maintenance is um, I've had probably uh, you know one uh, you know one specific issue with maintenance, and I can I can talk about what that was. It was something with my window where I felt like. Um, you know, there was some kind of a leak. And if I was driving, let's say, uh, you know, 60s, 70s, there was, uh, there was a little bit of, air. it felt like there was air, you know, leaking in as I was driving, right? So I, I, I go on the app, I say, okay, I have this issue. Guess what? They say, okay, our technician is going to come to an address of your choice. So I say, uh, okay, you know, this is where I am. And um, within, I think they set up an appointment for a particular day. They say, where would you be on that day? And I say, I'm going to be at work. They take my address, they show up, uh, you know, they repair it and they leave, right? So it's completely uh, seamless. And I thought it was a fantastic experience, right? I did not have to take a day off from work, go drop off my car and then drive another car or get a cab or have someone pick me up. I mean, there's so much of, um, there's so much of friction that's been, that's been removed from the process. But other than that, if you talk of regular maintenance, for example, um, you know, if I have to uh, uh, changing, you know, engine oil or something like that, right? And brakes and so many things, you will not believe it's been uh, 20,000 miles. Um, the only thing that I have done is uh, is basically tire is a tire rotation because some people, you know, on the forums and stuff like that on Facebook and, and a few other places, they recommend it. But then if you, if you follow Elon Musk on Twitter, he says that's also not needed, right? So I think that's, that's the other thing where uh, maintenance is so simple. And um, again, it's, it's a case of taking friction out and taking pain out of, um, you know, uh, of, the, of the owner, you know, the ownership uh, process, right? Now, um, the third thing is, is software upgrades. And uh, I think the, the interesting thing about that is, as you start to own a Tesla, I think the best part of it is it feels more like a phone than, than a car, right? So because you always keep getting upgrades and you know if you see there's an issue with your car, you don't have to take it to the store if you think there's probably an issue with braking or something like that, right? So 
uh, the, the software generally fixes most issues. So like how your, uh, your Android or your, or your iPhone gets updates and makes the phone better today than it is yesterday. That's how the car feels as well. So it almost feels like um, a phone on wheels, right? So it, it, it has that, uh, uh, it has that, it has that sense. Right. And then um, the other thing is, um, uh, is the self-driving experience so I, I of course when i when i bought mine it uh, i you know i bought um, uh, full full self-driving right fsd as as it's called and um, the best thing about it is because it's uh, you know it, it's got a brain of its own right so it you know it, it uses the whole uh, it's it's in the whole neural nets and stuff like that where it's constantly getting better and learning as it goes so my FSD today is way better than, uh, you know, when I bought it in what, October, 2019. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure that, you know, a month from now, it'll, it'll definitely be, be better than it is today. And um, that kind of takes me into the, into the next point of, uh, of road trips and stuff like that. Right. So when I'm, so the best part of FSD and the part where I use it the most is on highways and long drives. And it just makes, the whole um, driving experience so much smoother and so much more convenient, uh, Shashank. Right, so it, I think it's 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 that's the thing where you feel way less tired if you've driven, let's say, uh, six to ten hours. And I've I've done a couple of trips in that in that six to ten hour range, and you just feel way less tired. I mean, it's it's just so much it's so much more smooth, and um, you know you you have a lot of energy at the end of the drive as against traditional cars where you're. Uh, you know, where it's a lot of focusing, it's a lot of, you know, hand movements, leg movements and all of that, it kind of takes that away. And all you have to do is focus on the road and, you know, make sure that, um, you know, the car is not making any mistakes. You still have to kind of be this, um, be this guide or teacher to the car, but it's just brilliant uh, the way it works, uh, Shashank. So I think, um, you know, I, I don't know if that's a very long answer, but uh, that's my uh, perspective on uh, what I would think uh, first hand in terms of value proposition, uh, Shashank. So based on what you're telling me, right, it's got me thinking about Tesla as a company or as a product, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like the quality it puts in with its self-driving just made getting so much more advanced day over day, uh, the way it's so focused on its customer and the customer experience. It's almost like a combination of the high quality you get from Google along with the great customer experience and the ease of use you get from like an Amazon. It's like hmm. these two great companies and their ethos combined together to make Tesla, which I think is so fascinating. And that's why people love Tesla as a brand and a product. That's actually, that's, that's so true, uh, Shashank. You, you say that, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I never thought of it that way, but it does, it does make a lot of sense. I mean, it's got the... Uh, the software, the software mind of what Google would do, and the customer service of what Google would do, and, and you just made me think of something where customer yesterday. Would do. Sorry, what is that? A customer service of what an Amazon would do. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Amazon would do. I, I don't know what did I say. I, I Google would do. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, customer service of what Amazon would do, right? Yes, and. Uh, uh, and yesterday, I think uh, one of, you know, when I was listening to the, to the earnings call, I think one of the statements they made was the best service is no service. So they just build their cars so well that you don't need a lot of service. Like I've not serviced the car in, you know, like a year and a half, going to be maybe closer to two years now, but I, I just haven't serviced it. So I think that's, that's so true, um, uh, Shashank. So uh, moving on, uh, Shashank, right? So what is your perspective on the different types of vehicles that uh, that Tesla has, right? So I mean, uh, what, what's, what's your take on that? And can you maybe talk, a, maybe a quick well, overview of, of, of that? So in the last episode, we already spoke about a history, but I'm going to repeat it again. Um, mm -hmm. So Tesla right now has, I would say, five cars in stable, the, or it's produced five different cars in stable, which was the Roadster, which is now no longer being produced. Uh, the Model S, the Model X, the Model P, and the Model Y. Uh, and when I start talking about all of these, the Roadster was the high end which came out, which showed the world like, hey, an electric car can be 
a viable option. You can go super fast, a lot of fun, and it's really usable. From there, we moved on, or Tesla moved on and created Model S, which was completely done by Tesla, rather than what Roadster was, which was a combination with Lotus. And Model S showed what a high-end sedan could be as an electric car. And that was a way of garnering interest as well as helping people identify what value a, a good electric car can get. And that transition into the Model X for your classic family of four to five to six. Given that those two were really good cars and how they started getting adoption, the grand vision was building cars for the masses because any automaker if it has to be highly profitable, it has to basically build cars for the masses. And mm. that not that you, you have smaller automakers which are profitable, but they're not profitable at such a large scale as what Tesla wants to be. And that's why you start building cars for the mass, masses. And that's where you get the Model 3 and the Model Y, which is your classic, regular, small size sedan, as well as model y which is your your small crossover yeah and those have been raging successes and they basically are the embodiment of whatever you just spoke about great use really easy to buy very affordable total cost of ownership is not that high compared to some of the other cars in the same price range so and tesla's vision is obviously to get people off fossil fuels and on that vision would mean basically getting everybody to use an electric car. Yeah. If you need to get an electric car, everybody you need to address every single segment. So after addressing the four largest segments of four of the five largest segments, Elon then moved on to uh, get Tesla to create the Cybertruck, which is now your workhorse vehicles. Once you've got that, you've started addressing a large market, but that's not, not gone in the complete market. And then you start need to get things like a compact car, you need to get like a hatchback. And they're also talking about reintroducing the road search, I'm really, really excited about. Yeah. Uh, so that hopefully should address at least every market segment. Because if you look at countries like India or Southeast Asia, you don't have a lot of cars of the size of a Model S or a Model 3 as well, but you have much smaller compact cars or hot hatches. So you need to start building those vehicles for those, because mm. India and China combined together is a third of the population. So how do you get them to also start using electric cars? Uh, so I think that is the whole detail of uh, the whole gamut of the personal use cars. But then fundamentally talking about getting people off fossil fuel vehicles and getting them onto using renewable sources or electric cars. The other aspect is commercial vehicles, which is also a large portion, a large segment. We already had the first taste with the Tesla Semi, which is going to change how uh, freight transportation is being done. But I mm -hmm. really hope that they started looking at two more segments. One is delivery vans. I think there's certain electric companies uh, which are already starting to look at it. And I want Tesla to also come into that, hopefully at some point in the future, as well as looking at buses. So I think buses is a great mass transportation system, which could definitely help uh, get a lot of carbon emissions off the roads. Interesting. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, it, it's interesting you say that because I, I would think the skeleton for a for a van already probably exists uh, in the term of a cyber truck. It's probably just the external chassis that needs to, you know, be designed. I would think I'm, you know, I'm not an automotive engineer, but that's the way I would just think from first principles. And I think it's the same thing with the bus, where um, probably a lot of the brain and the muscle for the bus exists in the semi. Uh, it's, it's the body around it that probably needs some designing. And uh, again, that's, um, that's just my opinion. I don't know if, uh, if I'm kind of oversimplifying and overgeneralizing uh, a solution, but I, I think what you say definitely does make sense, uh, Shashank. It, it would not be impossible, at least that, that's, that's, my, that's my thinking. So 
moving on, uh, Shashank, can you talk a little bit about, let's say, uh, you know, the auxiliary uh, products, right? So that that Tesla has, and you know how uh, uh, what it does to make buying easier and stuff like that. You know, any any thoughts on that, uh, Shashank? So that's a great question, right? So we have spoken about how Tesla uh, created great value and made the buying experience easy for you as a as a buyer of a car. Mm-hmm. But I think Tesla's goal again is ties into that one unique point of making sure people get off fossil fuels and start using cars which are EV. And to that, it's not only having a electric car, but using it should be easy. Yeah. So you spoke about repair. You spoke about low maintenance but just one part of it but when you're on road trips you can't charge at home so you need to find a place where you can charge and that's where the supercharger network came in which basically spread its wings and now it's said to be this ubiquitous as ubiquitous as gas stations right so that is something which is adding value and making buying an easier thing of making it frictionless. The other aspect of it is you have electric cars, but just electric cars today versus a fossil fuel car, there's not too much to differentiate from except the amazing acceleration. One of the things which Elon Musk in his latest uh, earnings call spoke about was uh, talking about selling self-driving as hmm. a product to help other companies sell it as well, because that is another aspect of basically making sure people get off fossil fuels. Uh, They speak about uh, financing at some point where like other automakers do the same thing, but by Tesla allowing this financing, it makes the buying process so much more simpler. It's like a one-click process. It's making it as hassle-free as possible. They already have the insurance, which is there in California, right? I'm to then expand to the rest of the country and having Tesla insurance would probably help them drive the insurance prices lower for car owners, which will again push people to move away from the traditional fossil fuel based cars and go to an EV and especially a Tesla EV. Yeah. Right. Very cool. Yeah. Potential. There's, all, there's a lot of chatter about it. There's a lot of uh, third party folks who try to create a, a Tesla secondary marketplace, but I think Tesla will come out with their own marketplace at some point in time. And mm-hmm. why not have, like, Teslas are still expensive. Even the base model Tesla, uh, Model 3 is like 35 uh, plus uh, whatever taxes you have to pay. That's still expensive. How can you make it more affordable? Secondhand vehicles, right? Yeah, And if you have a great secondary market, that makes Tesla's, again, more affordable, more reusable. They, they start lasting much longer. And I think those things are what I would say are the pillars which make the buying experience of a Tesla so much more easier and help people transition of fossil fuel-based cars to electric cars and especially Tesla's. Makes makes a lot of sense, uh, Shashank. And I think, um, you know, so one thing that I'm very um, uh, curious about is for each of these things that companies do, I try to I try to kind of check, OK, uh, you know, how are the dollars coming in? Right. How is how is the revenue coming in? And um, you made some interesting points. So I think the first thing is about superchargers, you know, just by uh, selling supercharging to cars, you know, there's a revenue stream right there. Um, but also, I think there is talk of potentially sharing the supercharger um, infrastructure from uh, from a hardware perspective. That is the actual charging. But also, there's a very intelligent brain around uh, routing uh, through superchargers, right? I think so. That's that's a very that's a very uh, intelligent brain, and there's a software behind it. There's an algorithm behind it. And if Tesla can sell that um, as a package, there's there's an there's a revenue stream there as well. Now the other very interesting thing that um, that I wanted to talk about is around real estate pricing. You know, um, 
in the vicinity of a supercharger. And if you notice most of the times when, um, you know, when we stop at a supercharger, it's about a 10, 20 minute uh, break. And, you know, you probably want to pick up coffee or things like that. And initially, I think Tesla is the underdog, right? And, you know, it would have to probably pay to um, get a spot at uh, at a location that's good, right? Where, where, you know, users can probably at least get coffee and maybe a quick, uh, you know, grab something to eat and stuff like that. But I would think as, as there are more and more Teslas on the road and people are taking road trips, and if um, other EV owners also... Um, you know, start to use the Tesla infrastructure. I think Tesla starts to have have an upper hand, even from a from a real estate perspective, where you know people would start saying, "Hey, why don't you come and build your supercharger here?" Because we are getting a lot of auxiliary revenue from that, right? We are able to sell you know one thousand more coffees a day just because people are stopping here. We're able to sell you know two thousand dollars of food a day just because of you folks being you know being being able to come here or there'll probably be malls who say, you know, we're able to sell this much more just because of the existence of a supercharger, right? So not only um, there's real dollar value in having superchargers over time. I don't know if that's going to be today, but I would think that's also a revenue stream for them where they say, okay, we'll do it, but you have to pay for us to set it up, right? Or something like that. So, so basically, like, if you think about it, like look at traditional mall uh, infrastructure, Mm-hmm. They have the flagship store which comes in, which gets most of the people, and they give them at a deeper discount. But then they have the other smaller businesses also. Yes. And using Tesla, because you need a rest stop to charge your thing. That is how yes. things work today. And you use that. That's really fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, it could start like a bidding between, let's say, two two rest stops that are five miles apart and you know they start bidding saying hey you know we'll pay you fifty thousand bucks for you to set up your supercharger here as against you know over there and so there, there's a potential revenue stream there and i think you also mentioned um uh you know financing and you know obviously that's a revenue stream that i think you know there are there are banks and credit unions and so many other things worth billions of dollars just on that one thing, right? Only selling loans. So if that starts to pick up, that's another uh, revenue stream. And I think um, you also touched on insurance, I think, which is a very um, interesting point that I want to talk about that, um, uh, you know, again, it, it comes across in my research, right? So the difference between Tesla having its its insurance and let's say a lot of other companies having, uh, having you know, third-party insurance through a lot of other, you know, providers and stuff like that is, is, if if I'm insured through Tesla, if my car is insured to, through Tesla, they have a lot more. They have a lot more data. So one is, they have my driving data, so they can probably give me a discount if I'm a better driver, right? So I think that is that is one. The next thing is, um, uh, you know, if you see most of Warren Buffett's um, uh, money has been made through a lot of a few insurance companies, and uh, that's because they have a lot of cash coming in. So I think that's another advantage that, uh, that, you know, the insurance business starts to have when, uh, you know, when, when it's, when, when it started, right. And, and it's successful. The third, and I think a very important thing that a lot of people don't realize is when there is an accident, you know, the regular process is that you go, you report your claim and they check, okay, where was it, you know, where, where was the accident? And then, you know, you get a replacement part and stuff like that. Now, let's say that there are, you know, uh, 1 million cars on the road and, you know, let's say there are 10,000 accidents and Tesla starts to learn that these are specific parts in the car that are more prone to an accident as compared to the others, right? They can now start to improve their manufacturing such that those particular parts are stronger than the other parts, right? So now what happens is, uh, and they could probably charge a premium for it or, you know, consider customer service but you know, that's that's the secondary thought there but but if they start to make these accident prone parts um, either modular where it's easy to take out and put back in or let's say stronger which is or a combination of both right what happens is that it makes um, probably the losses to tesla from and tesla owners from an accident much lesser right so i think that's that's so you know accident data and claims data uh, that that tesla would get would also be worth its um, worth its weight in gold right so i think that is that is one now the next thing that you mentioned is um, is about the secondary car market and i'll just give you a very simple example right so let's say that um, i have a 50000 dollar uh, model 3 
and i you know i buy it today i use it for 2 years i sell it back to tesla at uh, at $40000 just as an example right now that very second and let's say i did not have full self driving and full self driving cost $10000 that very second in in let's say in 5 minutes they can add full self driving to that car in 5 minutes the value of that car is back to $50000 so they've added a $10000 profit in 5 minutes and then let's say you know they they make it look a little better here and there and you know they sell it at like $52000 let us say they've added now compare this to what a traditional you know auto manufacturer can do right or traditional car manufacturer can do they don't have the liberty to add $10000 to the value of a car in 5 minutes it's just you know it's unheard of can you think about you know uh, can you think about any other industry where something like this is possible and that's that's the advantage that i would say that um you know when a lot of um, when a lot of folks keep saying that tesla is an auto manufacturer it's probably not it's a lot more than that and that's the advantage that software gives uh, tesla as uh, as a company right so i think that's uh, that's another point that i wanted to make so uh, moving on and you know in the interest of time shashank uh, you are a software engineer you kind of understand algorithms you understand code and stuff like that uh, but um, can you maybe talk about a little bit about the um, the technology behind self driving and your thoughts and stuff like that uh, shashank please so self driving i think is the true secret sauce of tesla mm. right like self driving there's a lot of companies trying to do a lot of different things you have google with waymo trying to do it uber tried doing it and they're still trying to do it a couple of others trying to do it there's another company called cruise who's trying to do it tesla's approach is different and the way they run it is they are the only self driving car which is using cameras and they are like if the eyes are good enough for a human to drive cameras which is also which is basically a proxy for human eyes is also good enough uh there are good and bad uh, points to it good is yes it is equivalent to as good as a tesla like a human driving it is i do not agree with elon on the fact that lidars are not required because yeah. i think self driving can go much better and we've had a lot of discussions on that you and i yes. but yes and, and my my example is very simple a human today cannot spot a, a deer during mating season crossing the street and cars get hit and that's a big source of accidents in the US a yeah. lidar in the dark would be able to spot that and start taking evasive action, action let's say hmm. and that is basically the reason why i do not fully agree that being said here are the great points of tesla all these currently uh the companies which are handling uh, self driving like waymo uber cruise whatever they are creating a training data set by just having a bunch of people drive their cars around and creating that training data set there might be very specific use cases and there's initially good training data set but the amount of data tesla gets by regular people driving it is phenomenal and the biggest problem with any machine learning problem is you need good input data to be able for, able for the system to be able to predict very accurately yeah and the common joke which happens in industry is you're like garbage in is equal to garbage out and tesla in this latest earnings call spoke about how its auto labeling is the most advanced in the world and it's just getting better right so when you start having your label system labeling system to be so advanced the amount of garbage going into the system is far lesser than your competition so aut- automatically your self driving cars are getting so much better mm. and hence that becomes a technology mode which makes tesla really strong the other thing which tesla spoke about was selling self driving as a service yes that's great for making as a revenue stream but you would then have again more cars having the same self driving technology so you have more data and this is like a virtuous cycle where you start getting better labeling and hence better self driving and why is more data and more very data better for self driving because what tesla can start figuring out is they have a prediction 
and if the driver does something different from its prediction it shows that there is a mismatch and they can then start streaming this data in and identifying why was there a gap and then start labeling things better so then you obviously have auto labeling which is great but also you can then come in and have manual labeling when you know there is a mismatch and hopefully that will then kick start a better auto labeling system and that's another word to cycle and that's why self driving as a technology mm-hmm. is so good and tesla self driving is going to be so much better than everybody else till interesting and even if the rest start doing the same thing tesla self driving today the lead of tesla is so far ahead that trying to catch them might be really really difficult it's like trying somebody trying to catch google in search mm-hmm. microsoft tried it with the best of mm-hmm. engineers at that mm-hmm. time with ping and still could not manage to uh, corner or capture a large market share from google hmm interesting so uh, just a quick uh, thought um, i i have a few points for that but i still want to challenge you on this is do you think with uh, the whole you know uh, camera equal to eye analogy and the amount of data that te- tesla is collecting and the um, probably 1 million car, uh, you know cars on the road that's giving them the data do you think um, lidar at some point will be able to overtake that or is it just so much of a lead that uh, you know now it's uh, it, it's just not possible for you know i think something like a waymo that uses lidar or lidar or you know i don't know i don't know what cruise uses but but do, yeah, do you think lidar can overtake uh, overtake this technology at some point uh, shashank and just your thoughts your your opinion so so, so the way i look at it right mm-hmm. a camera or a lidar is just feeding in data hmm the problem here is labeling right mm. how do you get 100% labeling accuracy or i think 100% is very very difficult right but like 99.999% mm. labeling is that's only when you can actually have cars being completely automated and mm. that process is where that is the secret sauce of why self driving is the secret sauce the labeling is so good how do you get yeah maybe 15 years from now or 10 years from now waymo uber and stuff will probably get close enough to that level of accuracy of labeling as tesla does mm-hmm. but by then i'm really hoping tesla does not rest on its laurels and they start looking at the next technology mode and going forward with another technology mode after but at least it's opened up that lead and mm-hmm. yeah and each of them has their own pros and cons maybe lidar's only advantage over tesla is being able to label things seeing and able to label things in the dark interesting yeah, yeah. and mm-hmm. i'm really hoping at some point in time elon comes around uh because lidar technology has improved like the yeah, iphone 12s have a lidar in them if a phone can have a lidar adding a bunch of small lidars on the side of a car i don't think it would be that expensive that's all that's also true yeah he seems yeah strangely um, i i i see your argument uh, elon musk seems very adamant about not using lidars in fact one of the analysts um, i it was not this earning call to the uh, maybe a quarter or two back uh, asked him that um, Hey, what if lidar technology goes down to zero will you still would you would you use it then so the cost of a lidar goes down to near zero right he says no we probably will not so he seems very adamant on it uh, we'll see like you know i don't know what um, what his thinking is so uh, to summarize uh, this video shashank i just wanted to i think uh, a point that a lot of uh, a lot of folks are making right is that um, Tesla is predominantly an automotive company but i guess as we are speaking we kind of figured that it's not just an automotive company it it, it definitely uh, makes cars but it also is a manufacturing company it's it's you know breakthrough manufacturing um it's uh, a company that sells uh, you know charging and you know can can have a real estate play then uh, you know it can it can be um, partly th- there's a finance angle to it uh there's an there's an insurance angle to it there's um there's a very high value um uh you know uh, secondary car market uh, angle angle to this and i think the last thing i want to talk about is from a self driving uh, perspective right is they can first to 
to Tesla owners, I think, and you know, he spoke about this in the last earnings call, uh, was that they will probably start uh, having self-driving as a service. So there's a subscription, uh, you know, service that probably will come out for self-driving for a lot of folks who, uh, you know, who don't want to spend that upfront, let's say, ten thousand dollars to get. Um, self-driving and it's only going to increase from there and if you think about it a, a lot of that makes sense because the only time i use fsd is when i'm doing you know a road trip or a very long drive uh, that's that's through a highway and, and stuff like that right so i think that that's another potential uh, um, revenue service that's that's coming and then the other thing is and you also touched upon this and, and a lot of this is of course you know to my point of tesla is also a software company there's a software company hidden somewhere in there right so it's not fair to compare it to a lot of other automakers and the other thing you mentioned is it could start selling this technology like how Waymo does. So there's also a Waymo competitor hidden here, right? It could start selling their self-driving technology to a lot of other uh, to a lot of other companies, and that's a revenue stream. Now the other thing is, um, it's also potentially a ride-hailing service. If you think about it, uh, you know, once uh, there's there's a lot of uh, regulatory hurdles that need to be that need to be passed. But if you think about it, once it has uh, full self driving and you know let's say level 5 um, you know on on the auto, you know auto driving thing right uh, there's a there's a there's an uber lyft competitor hidden in somewhere in there and with the same thing there's also um, probably you know things like there's a doordash and there's you know all of that hidden in terms of value within tesla as as a company and i think the other thing that i wanted to quickly talk about was a last mile delivery as well so at the moment i think the biggest um, concern for uh, you know a lot of e-commerce and the fedexes the ups's you know even usps right uh, is um, uh, is is last mile delivery, right? So it, it's very easy, and they have a very structured way of bringing things um, from manufacturers or you know distributors into warehouses. But it's that warehouse to bringing it to your house and 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 mine, which um, is probably very labor intense and stuff like that. And if uh, you know, Tesla can work harder. I would think last mile delivery is something it can it can solve as well because uh, you know cars don't need sleep, cars don't need need a minimum wage. All they need is a little bit of charge and probably maintenance. At least if it's a Tesla car, maybe like you know every fifty thousand miles, every hundred thousand miles, right? And maybe an occasional you know um, tire rotation and stuff like that. But you can you know if you think about it, you can set the timing of your delivery. You can do a lot of other things. Um, if if there was you know an automated uh, you know if there was let's say full self driving right level five and um, with that I think I just want to close by at least from my side right uh, close by saying that um, it would be incorrect to um, to to compare Tesla to an automotive manufacturer let, let's say a Volkswagen or you know a Toyota or whoever right even the largest of large uh, automotive manufacturers GM or you know Ford let's say right so um, because there's a lot of other companies that that's hidden within Tesla in terms of if you look at the actual revenue streams within Tesla and we haven't yet gotten to one of your favorite topics, which is the energy side of Tesla, Shashank, right? So again, quick thoughts uh, from, from your side on this. A lot of people just think about Tesla as an automotive company and we already pointed out that why is it more than just an automotive company with all its secondary revenue streams, which are great. But then Tesla has this sleeping giant, as I like to call it, which is the Tesla energy side. This is something I've been really excited about where we can talk about its battery manufacturing, its end-to-end uh, -end supply chain around batteries, its HVAC systems, and so much more. This is something we should definitely should explore in an upcoming episode. Thank you, Shashank. I hope that soon, but um, this was a fantastic uh, discussion. I think uh, very insightful, and I hope uh, folks who are listening or uh, watching have uh, learned a lot from this. So, Shashank, thanks a lot for your time. Thanks.